Physician responsibilities of confidentiality, doctor-patient relationship, gifts from industry, abuse, impaired drivers, execution of prisoners, and torture. I know some of this may seem straightforward, but it's not. There's exceptions for all of them. Let's go through. The right to confidentiality is not absolute. It's not absolute. It can be broken when there's danger to others. Here's a couple of really good examples. STDs. I have a right to confidentiality. Yeah, but not when your STD could be infecting someone else. I have the right to confidentiality. Yeah, but not when your HIV can kill someone else. I have the right to confidentiality. Yeah, but you have tuberculosis, and we have the right to tell people that they've been exposed. And a court order means this. Let's say that you're a psychiatric patient, and you have been known occasionally to not be compliant with your medications, and you have paranoid schizophrenia. Well, if the courts determine that you're a potential danger to society, a court order demanding information has to be complied with, like any other subpoena. To keep it from illegal search and seizure, it needs a court order. However, when the court order is obtained, they have as many rights to go in and find the records as they do to come in and look in your house for guns or evidence of any crime. The right to confidentiality cannot be broken just for employers or for co-workers or for government agency or family or friends. Confidentiality is important, but not as important as protecting others from harm. But you see, employers and co-workers and government agency and family and friends, that's not the same thing as saying a police agency came with a court order saying we insist on finding the medical records. That's different. A patient with HIV and AIDS has repeatedly refused to disclose his HIV status to a sexual partner. The partner accompanies the patient to the office visits and is in the waiting room. The patient insists you not tell the partner. What do you do? The key issue here is repeatedly refuse to disclose status. That's the key issue. And if that's the case, then you must either notify that partner yourself or have the Department of Health notify the partner. The key issue here is that confidentiality of the patient is not as important as protecting the health of the partner. Put yourself in the position of the partner. Doctor, you knew my partner had AIDS and was having unprotected sex with me and you didn't tell me? Now I turned HIV positive. How could you not have told me? Now in notification, the health department doesn't walk up and say, Bob's got HIV, Bob's been infecting you, he's really a bad man. Doesn't go like that. It says like this, Dear Mrs. Smith, we at the health department would like to speak to you about an important health concern. She goes down to the health department. Mrs. Smith, you've been exposed to HIV. You should protect yourself and get tested. Well, who exposed me? Who? We're not going to tell you. But who did it? We're not going to tell you. Who did it? I can tell. But I only have one partner. Yeah, well, so that's as far as it goes. And the violation of confidentiality about saying, your friend Bob has been having unprotected sex with HIV, that doesn't happen. Zero. Never happens. You don't disclose the name of the person. You just tell them you are at risk. Confidentiality. A woman comes to your office with a valid identification from law enforcement or government agency. She requests a copy of your patient's medical records. What do you do? Well, you only provide health-related protected records, HIPAA, protected records to government agencies, including those from law enforcement, only if they have a valid warrant or subpoena. This is a biggie. A person can't say I'm a police officer and say I have the right to come into your house. They don't, it's in the Constitution. I'm a police officer, let me in. No, my house, it's private, it's my house. You don't right to have the right to be in here. I have a court order, okay, yes you do. So they only have the right to the information unless because unless they have a warrant, otherwise it violates the constitutional protection against illegal search and seizure property. Remember, HIPAA protects people's private health information. Health information is property. It's like a lamp or a table or chairs. It's information. You may not be able to taste it or touch it or smell it or put it on a scale, 
but it's information. It's the same as somebody saying, I'm coming in, I'm taking your car without your consent. You can't do it. An HIV positive healthcare worker simply does not have to disclose their status to their patients or their employers. They don't. Can you imagine a world like this? Hi, I'm Dr. Smith. I just want you to know I have AIDS. Well, you know what? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Or it goes like this. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob. I uh, want to get a job here. By the way, I've got AIDS. Well, the patients don't have to disclose their HIV status to you and you're the doctor. Why do you have to disclose it to them? HIV positive physicians have never transmitted HIV to patients through medical care. It's never happened. And that's why the patient is not at risk of an HIV positive physician, even if they're a surgeon or gynecologist. In terms of a doctor patient relationship, this one's very unusual for people. They don't know that you aren't obligated to accept everyone coming to you as a patient. You're not. You have to accept that person. And you have the right to end the doctor patient relationship too. Now, you have to give the patient time to get another caregiver. But the patients do not have the right to come into your office and say, you have to be my doctor. No. For instance, I myself, I only have a very small private practice. Now, in that, people can't come to the door and say, no, Dr. Fisher, you have to take me on as a patient. I go, well, no, I just don't have time. Oh, no, you do. I'm here. Now, that's different than when you're seeing them in the emergency room. The reason that students get this question wrong is they're thinking about when they're on the emergency medicine rotation and they see a doctor having to take care of everyone comes into the emergency department. That's different. That's a different type of acceptance into doctor-patient relationship. You have the right to refuse patients and you have the right to end that relationship. The only thing about ending the relationship is you can't just abandon them. Small gifts from patients are totally acceptable. The patient come and give you a tie, it's okay, as long as it's not tied to a specific treatment. It's like, small gift from a patient. Doctor, I baked you a cake. Okay, that's fine. Doctor, I got you a tie. That's fine. Doctor, I got you a tie. Now I want you to increase my Synthroid dose. That's not fine. Romantic or sexual contact between patients and their current physicians is never acceptable. Never acceptable. In psychiatry, it cannot be for a previous patient at any time. Gifts from industry is one of the only things that's changed in ethics in the last 15 years. 15 years ago, almost everything here would have had the same answer to it. But 15 years ago, it would have been acceptable to accept things like pens and pen lights, pads and cups that had logo or advertising information on it. Now the answer is even clearer. It's never acceptable. No gifts of industry. Nothing. Zero. No pens, no pen lights, no pads, no cups. None of that. Now a meal food in direct association with educational activity isn't considered a gift. A meal that I just take you out to just hang around with you, that is a gift. Buying you bagels or a piece of pizza isn't a considered a gift if it's in conjunction directly with an educational conference. Elder abuse can be reported against the consent of the patient. The key issue is whether the person is vulnerable. See, abused older adults are often too weak, fragile, or vulnerable to protect themselves. Then it becomes like child abuse. Elder abuse is treated ethically like child abuse. Now, elder abuse doesn't have a clear cutoff of age. It's not the age that makes it elder abuse. It's the fragility of the patient. If you have a 75-year-old cantankerous angry guy who's an older guy with a gun, well, that's not elder abuse. If you have a 55-year-old person who's had multiple strokes and dementia, and they can't take care of themselves, ooh, they're fragile. Elder abuse is defined as the fragility of the elder person, not the age. That's what distinguishes it from domestic violence and spousal abuse. See, for elder abuse in a fragile older person, it's implied in the question. The question would have to imply it's someone who just can't get up and leave or can't kick the family member out of the house. Like child abuse, the child can't get up and leave. It's vulnerable. Now, domestic violence is considered different. Under domestic abuse, you cannot report against the wishes of the patient. You can report 
and intervene only with the patient's consent because in domestic violence, which is sometimes called intimate partner violence, it is implied that the partner could leave if it is an adult with capacity. This is one of the least clear areas nationally. The impaired driver in terms of seizure disorder and driving, the states all have different rules. There's no uniformity and you have to answer something that says, sir, you must find another means of transportation. Now, I know that some people get very upset about this because they want to be able to report. And I understand that, except it's just not the rule. The wrong answers are you confiscate the car keys. Wrong answers that you mandatory reporting to law enforcement. Wrong answers mandatory reporting to motor vehicles. Wrong answers are hospitalizing the patient. Wrong answers is refusing to let the patient get in the car. We just can't do that level of enforcement. It is never ethical for a physician to participate in executions at any level. You cannot ethically formulate a lethal injection and even to do so much as pronounce a patient are dead. Even if the state law makes execution legal, physicians should never participate at any level. The question will say it's in a state in which it's legal. It will say the physician has no personal objection. It will say that the person has been legally convicted of the crime and in fact is guilty. It'll say all these things that make it look like it's okay. Doesn't matter what they say, it's not okay. We don't do executions. We also can't even say, well, please just help us make it painless. No, we just can't do that. That's the rules. Well, one person's enhanced interrogation techniques is another person's torture. Besides the fact that torture doesn't uh, obtain reliable information from detainees, physicians are never to participate in torture of prisoners or detainees at any level. Even if the question states, you're in the military, your ethical obligation of physicians supersedes your obligation to the military, period. And by the way, that's even in the military handbook right now. And this includes refusing orders from military superiors to participate in torture. You are supposed to refuse any order in which a superior at any level tells you to do something that's unethical. It also means keeping the torture safe so it's not fatal. In other words, it'll couch it with, you're not going to do the waterboarding yourself. You're there to monitor the pulse oximeter and make sure there's no hypothermia so that the waterboarding doesn't cause damage to the person. And that's all of it simply not correct for you ethically. You don't do it because none of it is considered to be the right use of your skills as a physician to potentially harm other human beings. That's why torture is the ethical equivalent of child abuse. Your participation is never acceptable and you're obligated only to report it.